Praise the Lord. And welcome again. Welcome to our current edition of our series of broadcasts, which we have tagged the State of the Union. And we are in talking about union, referring to the union between Jesus and his bride, the church. The body of believers we call Christians. And if you are watching this, you and I. And we are still about the business of the word of the Lord. In this particular case, the word of the Lord saying, tell my people to return to me. Tell my people to return to me. Now, I said it is the word of the Lord. In editions past, episodes past of this series of daily broadcasts, we have spent some time proving from the scriptures that God has often had occasion as at now or as like now wherein he needed to send to his people to return to him. Now, if we look at the scriptures, we will see that from time to time God raises men with a particular, specific message, a word which he commissions them with into the world. They may go about several other things, but one specific task would be credited to them. From Adam, all the way to the apostles. So for example, we know that Noah was referred to, Noah and even Enoch were referred to as preachers of righteousness. But Noah, more specifically, is credited with building the ark. Moses is credited with giving us the law. Nehemiah, besides being a leader of the people, is credited with rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem in particular. For the prophets, if we read carefully, we will notice that they were credited with the word of bringing back the people to God, especially as they strayed from time to time. Now when it got to such a one as John the Baptist, he did not only baptize the people with water, we are told from scripture that John's baptism was for the washing away of the filth of sin. And then he said to the people, bring forth fruit worthy of repentance. Should we talk about Jesus? At the beginning he came preaching, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. And by the time he finished, he had successfully introduced the father to the consciousness of his hearers. Of course, we know that the early apostles and the early church simply preached Christ. So, like I said, from time to time, God has given a particular word to be delivered. In this case, he says, tell my people 
to return to me. And because of that, over the past days, weeks, months, it's now almost 15 months since inception, we have looked at one or the other, one or the other dimension in which we may have walked away from God, for which he is saying, tell my people to return. And in the past couple of days, and each time I say that, I realize it's getting closer and closer to two weeks. We should, have, we should be about the 10th or the 11th day now. We have been looking at the business of the Father as revealed in the person of Jesus. For he said, I and my Father are one. I and my Father are one. If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Whatever you see me do, it is the Father operating in me. Whatever you hear me say is as the Father first taught me. So we understand that Jesus was about the business of revealing the Father. Either in word or in deed. He said, I came to honor my Father. But you dishonor me. Okay. So Jesus said in several different places, I tell you these things so that when it happens, you will know that I said so. First he said that in John chapter 14. Then he said a similar thing in Matthew chapter 28. In Matthew chapter 24 first. He said, see, I have told you beforehand. When he was talking about the signs of the end of the age. As if to say that the word of God has a certain feature or characteristic of telling us what is to come. In other words, since every word spoken by Jesus was as he was first taught by the Father. By implication, the Father tends to reveal things before they happen. So when he says, tell my people to return to me, is it just possible that he is asking us to return because he wants to tell his children certain things. He wants to tell his children certain things. Not just returning in the business of fellowship, but tell my people to return to me because there are some things I want to pass across to them. So for example, in sending out Abraham, the idea was to, through Abraham, bring forth the revelation of the father. He said, you will be a father of nations. Hmm. So we begin to look at the purpose of the father in asking his children to return. Now we see in Genesis, in Genesis chapter 49, from the very first grandfather Jacob sends for a gathering of all his children. And I want to read it so that we can participate. Genesis chapter 49, verse 1. And Jacob called unto his sons. Did you hear that? And Jacob called unto his sons and said, Gather yourselves together that I may tell you that which shall befall you in the last days. 
Jacob called unto his sons. Genesis chapter 49, verse 1. And Jacob called unto his sons and said, Gather yourselves together, that I may tell you that which shall befall you in the last days. Verse 2. Gather yourselves together and hear ye sons of Jacob and hearken unto Israel your father. Obviously, they gathered to him because in the subsequent verses, he starts to tell them by name what would befall them. May I ask a question? What was it about Jacob that empowered him to speak forth concerning his children in this manner? Because he said, from verse 3, Reuben, thou art my firstborn, my might, and the beginning of my strength, the excellency of dignity, and the excellency of power. He's talking about his firstborn. And then he goes on in verse 4. Unstable as water, thou shalt not excel, because thou wentest up to thy father's bed, thou defilest, thou, and then defilest thou it, he went up to my couch. Simeon and Levi are brethren, instruments of cruelty are in their habitations. Oh, my soul, come not thou into their secret, unto their assembly, my honor. Be not thou united, for in their anger they slew a man. We know that it was not just a one man, they slew an entire city. And in their self-will, they dig down a wall. Cursed be their anger, for it was fierce, and their, and their wrath, for it was cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. Judah, thou art he whom the brethren shall praise. Thy hand shall be in the neck of thy enemies. Thy father's children shall bow down before thee. And then he goes on in verse 9. Judah is a lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, thou art gone up. He stooped down, he couched like a lion, and as an old lion, who shall rouse him up? Now the point of all this, because if we continue to read, we begin to see more and more of the things which he spoke concerning his children. Now the things which he spoke concerning Judah in particular, we know are fulfilled in the person of Jesus. Some of them first in David. Okay, for example, since I talk about David, for example, in verse 10, he says, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. I'm sure you know this song. And unto the Lord shall the gathering of his people be. We are gathering together unto thee. So that statement is a reference to a gathering unto the Lord Jesus. We know that. But Judah, sorry, Jacob is talking to Judah. He says, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet. That is to say, in the generations of Judah, the scepter shall remain with Judah in his generations to come. The people will be gathered unto him as their leader. So he goes on and on and he talks about what would befall his children. And this matter about Judah, about the scepter, we see repeated when the prophet is sent to David because David wanted to build a house for the Lord. And the Lord said to him, because you have thought of this, the kingdom will not depart from your house. I will give you an eternal kingdom. That eternal kingdom promised David is consummated today in Jesus. We know that. But here is the question. What was it about Judah, about Jacob, 
which empowered him to speak thoughts concerning his children. That's one. Secondly, why did his words come to pass? Why did his words come to pass? And this is something we need to be careful about. The father says, tell my people to return to me. There are things he wants to say to his children. Now, I don't want to take too much time reading the entire length of what Jacob had to say in Genesis chapter 49 to his 12 children, I mean the 12 boys. But he had something to say concerning each of them. He said, let them gather so he can tell them what will befall them in the last days. There is a dimension in the Father where he does two things. Speak forth concerning his children, thereby creating their future. And the second one, just like the first, is that the Father in determining the child's future can actually put a blessing or a cause. In other words, the word of the father is critical in the life of the child. So God says, tell my people to return to me. May I ask a question? What is the word of the Lord that is operating in your life and circumstance? If we agree that God generally begins things by speaking about them and speaking them into existence, what is the word of the Lord which began your beginning? Because God will necessarily speak concerning that which will be. It is a dimension of the Father. It is something about the Father. Look at Abraham, the father of all them that believe. I just stopped myself from saying our Father. But the scripture says so. The Father of all them that believe. What did he do? He called all his children to himself, gave them gifts, and sent them away, away from Isaac, thereby establishing a boundary, as it were. They were not to cohabit. And then he called Isaac, the Bible says, and to Isaac he gave everything. Why? What is the everything that he gave Isaac? Why is it the responsibility of the father to do that? To establish the future of the destiny of his children? What is it that empowers the father figure to be able to do that? I give a simple answer because it is a dimension of God the Father that he has deposited in Father's figures or in Father's. Now that may be a warning or a piece of counsel as the case may be. But I'm not talking about human fathers. I'm talking about God the Father who says, tell my people to return to me. You know, for, for, for some days now, I've been anxious or, if you like, worried about a particular matter. Now, because I know the weight of what I'm saying right now, upon occasion, I have gone to the Lord and I have said to him, Lord, speak concerning this matter. Say something to me. Give me a word. Why? Because I know that God does things by his word. So after a, after a while, he just ministered to me 
to go back to the original word he gave perhaps about 10 years ago concerning that matter. And as I went back to the scriptures to, to, to re-examine what he gave to me at the beginning, I was shocked to see one of the verses of scripture which he gave me because he was so explicit and it re-established it re-established me in my hope and in my expectation. When God says, tell my people to return, or tell my children to return to me, there is a word that is in season. There is a word from the Father which he wants to speak. The problem is whether we are listening. The problem is whether we will even come to him. You know, it's one thing to come to the Father with your own problem. It's another thing to come to the Father because he is the Father. You know, when you come to the Father because of problems you think you have, you hardly give him the chance to talk. And you know, there's something we do. After we have laid out all our issues, we generally walk away, not realizing he has something to say. But there's something hidden in Ecclesiastes chapter 5, the very first verse. It says, when you are before the presence of a king, hold your peace. In other words, don't talk. Give the king the honor of ceding the floor to him. Let him be the one to talk. It's a mark of honor. It's not that you don't have something to say, but let him talk first. Now we all we have to learn this in the practice of the presence of the Lord, that when we come before him, you should let him be the one to talk, at least to talk first. Why is that? He often has something to say, either in his silence or he, in his actually saying something. Now when God speaks, it can be any of a variety of reasons to establish a variety of purposes. I've come to realize, because God says, tell my people to return to me. That when God speaks, he can bring illumination that is, he shines light on the subject about which he is speaking. He said, the entrance of your word gives light and understanding to the simple, or if you like, the foolish. The entrance of your word brings light. Psalm 119, verse 130. 105 first says, verse 105 first says, your word is a lamp unto my feet. It's a lamp. It's a lamp, light unto my feet. It brings guidance and or direction. So the word of the Lord brings illumination. But it also brings guidance. It also brings guidance. And in bringing guidance, it brings direction. You know, many of us are confused, uncertain about certain things. And rather than simply returning to the Father, at least concerning that matter, we begin to look for answers where answers don't exist. We begin to run from pillar to post, maybe even looking for who we pray for or with us. But the issue is with the Father is his word. And his word characteristically determines our future, determines our hope, determines our expectation. He creates by his word. So when God speaks, depending on the nature of what he says, he may not just be prophesying, for example, but in the nature of that word, he creates the future that we are going to experience. No matter what you may think, no matter what your circumstances may be, when God speaks, he generally frames our world by his word. 
So in returning, there is the hope of illumination, guidance, and direction. Now that's on the one hand. On the other hand, when God speaks, several other things can happen almost at the same time. It can bring understanding. Not just illumination, which just means light. You see the matter better. But now you have understanding of the matter. Let me explain the business of understanding a bit. Split the words which constitute the word understanding. It becomes understanding. So understanding is simply this. Being granted insight into what is under that which is standing. That which is standing is what you currently can see, is what you currently know, is what you can currently perceive, is maybe what you have already heard. That's what is standing. That's what is before you. There is always something beneath that. There is always cause and effect. You may not know the cause doesn't mean that something didn't cause it. When God speaks, he can grant us understanding. He can grant us insight into what is really going on. Beyond or besides or beneath that which is apparently in front of you. And you know, once you have understanding of the problem, the problem is virtually solved. Because now you know what's going on. Now you can position yourself to leverage the situation, take advantage of it, or prosper by it, if you like. So he says, tell my people to return. I want to tell you something. I want to tell you some things. I want to, I want to transmit something to you. I want to impart something to you. I want to speak into your life. I want to create a future for you. And for some of us, it may be that he wants to change the trajectory of our lives, the tra trajectory of our circumstances. You may be struggling under the weight of something right now, and then you return to the Father, and he speaks a word guaranteed to change that circumstance. I said, on the other hand, when God speaks, there is a possibility or several possibilities which can happen at the same time. One of them is understanding. The other one is insight. And the third one is counsel. He presents it to you in a manner that you can use that thing that you understand. So you not only understand, you are clear about how to proceed. And by the way, these are all functions of wisdom. Sometimes when God speaks, another set of possibilities come into play. All these are variants of wisdom, don't get me wrong. It's called discernment. It can also be discretion. Or it can just be plain knowledge. It just grants you information which you didn't have or could not have discovered by yourself. It just tells you. And you notice the full stop. It just tells you something. It gives you knowledge. Or if you like, information. Sometimes that information or knowledge helps to prepare you for a future circumstance. Sometimes it helps about a current circumstance. The point is, we can do not much without knowledge. It says, for example, my 
people perish for lack of knowledge. Yes, the knowledge in question was the knowledge of God. But knowledge all the same. We generally perish when there is no knowledge. But he says he brings discernment. When God speaks, he imparts to us the capacity to choose between any two things, especially good or bad, what we ought to do, what we should be doing, or what we should be choosing. So while discretion is a function of choice, discretion is a function of action. Discretion helps us to make wise choices about what we should do or not do. Discernment helps us to make the same wise choices, but to unveil something that is not immediately apparent. So we can discern something that is not immediately obvious, because we have a word from God. And why am I saying all these things? They are all functions of the word of God. When God says, return to me, we saw what Jacob did with his children. He began to speak concerning their future. Jesus said, lo, I have told you. That is to say, I have told you beforehand. It's just that in saying those things, he was creating what was going to happen. Not just foretelling it. So the father says, tell my people to return to me. Is it at all possible that he is asking us to return to him in the, in the capacity of father because there is something he wants to speak concerning our lives? Is it just possible that there is a new direction or a new level of oppression that he wants to launch us into, but which we cannot access outside of his word as our father. So he says, tell my people to return to me. The father beckons. There's history to be made. There's a future to be set into or to be set on course. There's a trajectory to be changed. There's an alignment to be made. But first he says, return to me. And my time is up. But we'll do this again tomorrow. Continuing in the light of the Father. How can you spend time anywhere else but with your father? Even in the biological one. Because there's so much insight to be gained. I'll see you again same time tomorrow. God bless.